Hi there and welcome to another episode of the Praying Christian Women podcast. I am really excited today to be here with what we think is our first solo male guest on the podcast, Patrick Morley. Um, Patrick, thank you so much for being here. Jamie, it's a, it's an honor. I'm excited to be with you. Uh, I am thrilled with the uh, the thought that you've put into women and the, the impact that a book like this might have on the way they think about their husbands and who knows, maybe even for themselves as well. Absolutely. Well, Patrick is author and founder of Man in the Mirror. And their goal is to equip Christian men around the world to engage in meaningful relationships that change lives and build the kingdom of God. Um, he's author of lots of other books, but today we're going to talk specifically about his most recent release, which is From Broken Boy to Mended Man. And uh, it's a positive plan to heal, heal your childhood wounds and break the cycle. So I just, um, yeah, I think this is absolutely an important topic for men, it's a book designed for men, for women who have men in their lives that we need to recognize these things and pray for them. But I think for women to just be thinking about these things as well. I don't know that this, you know, I, it can't hurt to read this book as a woman and come away with some insights as well. So yeah, I'm excited to jump in. But before we do, we'd like to ask all of our guests, what is your favorite prayer closet in air quotes? Where do you like to go to connect with God? Well, um, so my favorite place or my most frequented place? Ooh, can you tell us both? I'd love to know both. And I okay. love that they're different. <laughs> well, so my most frequent and pl frequented place is, uh, is a chair in our living room where I usually get up around four o'clock in the morning. Don't ask me why. But anyway, <laughs> I get up early and uh, I have a chair and... Uh, I've been sitting in that specific chair, that exact chair for, for over 30 years. <laughs> so uh, so that's the most frequent place. Uh, but my actual favorite place is hiking. Uh, I have uh, six rote, R-O-T-E prayers that I cycle through pretty much every day. And uh, and uh, I love to go hiking and, and uh, I, I hike solo. Somebody said, well, why do you hike alone? I said, well, actually, I don't hike alone. I'm, <laughs> you know, because God and I are a majority in every situation. And so, but when I, uh, I'm hiking, I like, I like to be uh, alone with the Lord and the majesty of creation, a great cathedral, you know, to, of worship. And so then I usually start with my prayer, one of my six prayers at the beginning of the hike. And then four hours later, I say, amen. Wow. I love that. So. I, I totally can relate to the connection with God through nature. And I think it's not only being in the presence of his creation, um, but just the act of walking for me. I tend to get distracted if I try to close my eyes and bow my head. I, I do that. And I can get very meditative in that way or sitting in a chair or whatever. But something about doing something with one part of your brain, walking, see, you know, taking in what's around mm -hmm. you, and then praying also it just somehow i don't know it it works for me and i i love hiking or walking or just being in nature with god well, i would like I, to oh go ahead i was just gonna say my favorite part of the of uh, the hiking prayer are the rabbit trips so yeah. uh, i'll say uh, our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name and then i'm thinking about the holiness of god for the next mm -hmm. five minutes and remembering things that has, have happened and praising him and blah, 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 and then come back to the prayer. So, you know, there's not that hurriedness uh, uh, when you have a, a normal work day. Well, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about this idea of rote prayers that you go through each day, because we've had multiple discussions over time about the benefits, the pros and cons of spontaneous prayers versus rote prayers or liturgy or prayers that you write down and you recite over and over again, whatever those are. So what are your thoughts on that? And um, and how did you come to de to decide on those prayers that you pray? Yeah. Well, let's just say that uh, I've got us increasingly called me to a ministry of prayer uh, over the years. Uh, for the last 12 years, I spend a one day a week in prayer with fasting. I do a 24 hour 
fast, skip two meals. I'll drink some protein shakes or something because I usually keep working and then set aside some specific time for the uh, prayer. I pray for prodigals. I have uh, 78 prodigals and their parents because the parents are usually the ones that are hurting the most. Well, actually, that's not true. Everybody, everybody's in pain when there's a prodigal in the family. But uh, And sometimes, you know, prodigal is a funny word. It, it doesn't. I use it as a metaphorically for all kinds of reasons why children are off the reservation, not necessarily wild living, you know what I mean? Could be just really struggling in their belief system. But anyway, so, um, and so then uh, these prayers have just sort of evolved. Um, like one prayer is, uh, Lord Jesus, today I make a full, total, complete surrender of my life to your Lordship. Uh, that's a very short prayer, right? But living the rest of my earthly life for the will of God is, is my life purpose and has been since probably uh, before you were born uh, uh, since 1986. You look so young. Uh, You're so kind. <laughs> 76. 76. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, and then uh, the Lord's Prayer. I mean, the disciples said, said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And this is how I said, you should pray. So. Oh, that's the, probably not a bad idea. And then I've got others too. But the, the other thing is uh, uh, that doesn't preclude spontaneous prayer. And that doesn't uh, preclude uh, praying throughout the day. Pray without ceasing you know, and everything. Give thanks. Pray without ceasing. Uh, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and petitions and requests. And so, uh, you know, I have prayer throughout the day in other ways too. But I do think that having these particular set prayers, these rote prayers, uh, does have on me, and everybody's different. There's no one right answer to this. That's why we talk about it one way, talk about another. It really boils down to personal preference. Um, but there are traditions that have proven over the years that rote prayers are good, uh, can be good. I grew up in a church that had uh, uh, a uh, common book of prayer, and uh, it was the most boring thing I've ever seen in my life. So some people might find rote prayers that way even today. And I understand that. But for me, they really seem to uh, draw me in. My first prayer of the day is typically to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, without going through the whole thing, it's, you know, Father, uh, I, I come to uh, meet with and abide in you, our much-loved creator, sustainer, and redeemer. And I pray that you would meet with us, your much-loved sons and daughters. And uh, a same, same, uh, a similar one for Jesus, meeting with Jesus and meeting with the Holy Spirit. And that just really brings me into the, pal really, I think it's the palpable sense of the presence of Jesus. That's what I'm looking for. And I'm also not wanting to leave my prayer closet, as you call it, until I have what I call a moment of humility. It's just, it can come through reading the Bible. It can come through prayer. It can come through uh, singing. Uh, wow, that's something definitely do by myself. Or <laughs> uh, journaling. And uh, But there's just a sense of uh, overwhelm, uh, a moment of humility where I'm, I'm, uh, become palpably, uh, really palpably aware of the presence of Jesus in just such a, a an over, overwhelming way that it just washes away every uh, selfish thought for at least three minutes. <laughs> wow, that's a lot of good stuff to talk about. And that could probably be a whole episode on its own. But I just wanted to touch on what I just, yeah. I love what you had said before that really perfectly illustrates your, I don't know, your argument for using some of this, you know, pre-composed prayers, um, or, you know, at least prayers that you know that you're going to pray ahead of time, um, yeah. is that it works for you. That's, that's number one, everybody is yeah. different. Um, mm -hmm. but also that it doesn't exclude any other kind of prayer. And not only that, you give this illustration of walking and hiking mm -hmm. and using those prayers as a launch pad for those spontaneous prayers. I mean, there's just no limit to how God can use those kinds of prayers. And I think for someone who finds it hard to focus in prayer, I think 
a lot of these, you know, if you have a prayer that you like to read or recite, it can be kind of an anchor and it could get us started. It can be a, a launch pad like for you or even just a way to express what you want to say to God on a regular basis, even if you don't deviate from it. And I think that's just a really great example. Hmm. Um, but what I also love is what you just said. I've never heard anyone talk about this. You choose to pray until the point where you have this moment of humility. And I would love to hear just a little bit more about that and what that means to you and why it's important. Why is that important in your prayer life? Well, I grew up um, as a broken boy, and we've got a book now on that, huh? And we'll talk about that. But um, net net is that um, I came to faith in Jesus through the prayers of my wife. Uh, I had tricked her into marrying me. I thought I was a Christian. Um, you know, I grew up in a Christian home that didn't know Christ, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, and so. Uh, yeah, I uh, kind of lost my train of thought here. Oh, Back that's okay. The Just the question of why is it so important for you in your prayer life not to come away from a prayer until you've had that moment of humility yeah. or that encounter? Yeah, exactly. And so, because of my my growing up experience, I had a uh, I had a very low view of God, and I had a very low view of the church. And because of overcompensating, I had an overly high view of myself. Hmm. Okay, so now you sit down and you have this this guy who doesn't think much of the church, thinks God is you know pretty pre pretty big guy, but not that big, and he and he thinks that he himself is is a pretty big thing. And so uh, what I saw happening over the first uh, decade of uh, my faith is that this uh, really interfered with uh, developing uh, you know, any kind of a transformative uh, relationship with God. And uh, after I called a timeout and got myself squared away, long story for another day, perhaps, but uh, I started praying uh, and with the idea that I was going to try to see, well, the, here's the great, I have to at least tell you the greatest lesson I've ever learned. I'm sitting around in the rubble of my life and, and a thought goes through my life. Uh, there is a God we want and there is a God who is. They are not the same God. Ooh, that's a very, very profound point. <laughs> <laughs> and the turning point of our lives is when we stop seeking the God we want mm. and start seeking the God who is. So it just dawned on me, Morley, what have you been thinking? Did you really think that any amount of you wanting to reinvent God in your imagination was going to have one iota of impact on his unchanging nature and character. And so I came to my devotions and I had the idea, I want to see a little larger glimpse of this God who is. And I want to invite God to help me jettison a little piece of the God or the gods that I have wanted and so here's what happened. And this, we're talking about how the moment of humility came about. So I, I, I noticed that God started to become higher and more holy and greater in my thoughts. And as he kept getting higher, one day I looked around and I realized I wasn't as big of a deal as I thought I was. And so my own thoughts about myself started to go lower and lower and lower and lower. And so what I, I, I came to see, uh, see that there's this, this increasing gap between the holiness of God and, uh, and uh, you know, really my unworthiness, if you will, uh, and, and how his grace and love and mercy bridge this gap. And I, I've come to think of this, I call it the awe gap. Uh, it's, 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 and, and so the, the degree to which this gap gets bigger, the more in awe I am of God, the more reverence I feel for him, the more of gratitude, spirit of gratitude I have for his love and mercy in, in my life. And so each day, what, what I'm looking for is, is I'm looking to increase that awe gap a little bit by having this moment of humility where I have, have this 
this uh, this uh, palpable sense of the presence of Jesus or an epiphany of some kind. So uh, that's the big picture. <laughs> well, I think that that, you know, prayer is so multifaceted. They're all different uh, reasons we pray. Um, mm -hmm. But the side of prayer that transforms us, obviously it all transforms us. It's a relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, the creator of the universe, it's going to transform us. But, um, but the, the, the side of prayer, when we focus on how prayer changes us versus how our prayers influence the world or bring God's kingdom to pass, um, which changing us is part of that. Um, but I see that that is the key to it is seeing God for who he is, yeah. is, is the biggest way that we can be transformed be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will until we are transformed in that way, which I think is very much what you're talking about. Our minds are being renewed and we're becoming less me focused and more, oh my goodness, God is at the center. Wow, what a novel idea. And it just helps us to see everything different. And I think it helps us be in a place where we can pray more effectively for others like and for ourselves and for the world when we put god in his right place and realize where he is so that's yeah that's a lot to think about thank you for bringing mm -hmm. that up i'm excited to kind of mull that over some more <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> well let's get into your book because this is you know we i have so many questions that i would love to get into so you wrote this book it's called broken boy mended man so can you just tell us in a nutshell, what is this book about um, and what inspired you to write it? Okay. So um, from broken boy to mended man, a positive plan to heal your childhood wounds and break the cycle. Um, when uh, I was turned 53, my uh, mother died and I didn't feel anything. I wasn't sad. I didn't cry. I didn't miss her. I thought that was pretty odd. And so I decided that I would go to a counselor to try to figure out what was going on. And over a period of uh, sessions, eight, she helped me to put into words the father and mother wounds that I had never been able to articulate. In fact, probably, probably beyond the scope of a podcast, but I... I really had emotional amnesia, uh, you know, so everybody compartmentalizes things, but amnesia is that you literally cannot bring these thoughts back into your consciousness. And so uh, uh, just one example, I used to race motocross when I was in uh, college and uh, my parents only came to see me one time. And that happened to be the day that I had a nasty crash and got flown to the uh, hospital in a helicopter. And it was not until I was writing the book. <laughs> so a lot, decades later, it was not until I was writing the book that I, I was remembered that my mom and dad didn't even come to the emergency room, hmm. e even though I'd been flown there in a helicopter. Now, you would think that that would be so tr traumatic that I, I would be devastated, but I didn't even remember it, you see. Uh, and so... A, a lot of a lot of you know there basically there are millions of men just like me who have uh, childhood wounds and uh, in many cases don't even know uh, that they have childhood wounds but they're walking around some of them are walking around the city on a volcano of anger and they are ready to erupt uh, they you know they can they can they they get set off by the, the most crazy things and they don't even understand their own behavior or they're lashing out or they withdraw, uh, they pout, they uh, are destroying their relationships and really don't even understand what's what's going on. And so uh, I wanted to write this book from Broken Boy to Mended Man just to, to help guys basically shortcut what took me uh, several decades to work through. Uh, they can go to school on my experience and I think a uh, compress that down into a much shorter time of healing and cycle breaking. Yeah. And, you know, it has me thinking, I mean, as a parent, it has me thinking about 
things maybe I've done to my own kids that might end up at some point having them reflect. But as a wife and for those listening who are women that have men in their lives, whether it's husbands or brothers or fathers, um, I know that their, you know, curiosity has to be piqued here. So what would you say are some of the most common kinds of childhood trauma that in speaking with men over the years that you've been in men's ministry um, that you've, you've heard of, or that you've yourself have experienced that have, that can go unrecognized. Yeah. Well, first of all, my favorite thing to do, I do a lot. I, I write books, 23 of them. I, I've uh, been teaching the Bible for uh, decades. We have like a thousand YouTube videos uh, on written 750 articles, but my favorite thing to do is to meet with men one-on-one. -on -one. That's my absolute favorite thing to do. And so when men try to put into words what they feel like is holding them back, what's keeping them from feeling fully alive, they will in inevitably mention one or more of seven things. Now, this is my taxonomy. And so one of your listeners, some of your listeners might want to add something else or reword it or whatever. But these, these are my seven. Number one, a guy will say in so many words, I just feel like I'm in this alone. I don't feel like God cares about me personally, not really. I don't feel like my life has purpose, feels random. I have these destructive behaviors that keep dragging me back down. My soul feels dry. My most important relationships, they're not healthy. And then finally, I just don't really feel like I'm doing anything that's going to make a difference and leave the world a better place. And so uh, one, of, one of the characteristics of broken boys is that you, the broken boy, we just are on, we are, we're unable to get control of these uh, negative voices uh, in our heads. So um, then that's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is the flip side. So if, if you had parents who were, uh, good at parenting, then you would likely say, well, my parents were encouraging. Or maybe you would say my parents were affirming. But what if you can't say that? Well, then you might say one or more of seven things, seven different parenting styles. And I go into these in the book to help. In fact, I have an exercise at the end of each of these to help uh, men figure out uh, whether, you know, just to self-assess where they are with these, but uh, my parents were passive, which that was part of my situation. Um, you know, I had, my parents gave me way too much say. My parents were uh, passive or my parents were absent, and that can be through divorce, death, mental illness, many different things, uh, or maybe too tied to the American dream and not involved enough. Passive, uh, absent, uh, permissive, uh, you know, you're able to get away with almost anything but murder. And then uh, my parents were enabling a lot of uh, a lot of kids grew up with parents who just think that their kids can do no wrong. Uh, so they uh, don't require them to do things they can and should do for themselves and don't hold them accountable for things they shouldn't do. That's that that is the definition of enabling. And then uh, my parents were were angry, uh, tow around your house because their anger is just always boiling, you know, right below the boiling point, right below the surface. And you, you never knew exactly what was going to set them off. And so uh, the next one, uh, six is my parents were demanding. Uh, so your parents, uh, you, you were not given a voice, you were given orders, you didn't have conversations. And then finally, my parents were belittling. So this is actively making jokes at your expense, belittling you, saying things that demean you. I had one of my best friends for 17 years. He's not with us anymore. But when he was growing up, he had a little friend at his house when he's about eight years old, something like that. And it was time for Timmy to go home. And my friend Jim and Timmy, uh, they went to the door. And then my friend's dad said to the neighborhood boy in front of my friend Jim, he said, Timmy, 
you come back anytime. I sure wish I had a son like you. And he never got over that. I mean, he literally never got over that. And so these are seven different parenting styles. We'll go into all this in the book. But uh, so between these inner aches and pains that men have, and then these parenting styles that basically help contribute to those feelings, uh, there are a lot of a lot of men who are walking around with childhood wounds that uh, really need to be healed. Yeah. And what you kind of mentioned anger, um, but what are, what are some of the ways that this comes out? Um, what is, what would be a red flag? I mean, I kind of, what I'm thinking as I'm looking through all of these is I feel like all of us have some kind of childhood trauma, probably. I mean, I, it just seems like, like we live in a fallen world, so there has to be some, but what are some warning signs that might be coming up in someone's life that might be kind of like, hmm, you really maybe need to look into this a little bit more. I mean, I think it's valuable for anyone, but what are right. some what are some red flags that you have some real childhood trauma that might not have been addressed? Yeah, well, back to your first point there, 70 to 80% different experts say that about 70 to 80% uh, families are dysfunctional yeah. and that's that's a continuum or spectrum right, I right. Mean, from mild dysfunction where we're able to work through things to all the way to uh, toxicity or even abuse uh yeah. and, and i mean i have got some abuse stories i've heard over the years that are pretty uh you know curl your ears the uh so uh what maybe like a diagnostic well um Alcoholics Anonymous, they have their list. Uh, adult children of alcoholics, they have their list. These different groups have their list. So I figured, well, um, the Fraternal Order of Broken Boys, we need our list too. So I developed a list of, of nine characteristics that get fleshed out in the book. By the way, for most of my books, I uh, I and for this book too, I really want to give value in this session you know uh but in a lot of my previous books i don't know the right way to say this but i probably have given people so much that they don't really need to buy the book i mean you know they could just you get the, the big idea this is not that book uh this is a book you actually have to go through the process it's not an intellectual it's not intellectual knowledge only you actually have to go through the process of doing the exercises in the book i'm all about i'm all about uh, giving them the practical help that they've been looking for the practical help that will help get them where they want to go but this is a book we actually have to go through and do the thing so you know i i these seven parenting styles i just talked about no no you you can't just hear them right and then okay well now i get it honestly you don't <laughs> so i'm just telling you you know um so with these characteristics, though, the number believing that people really care about you. So if you grew up in a home where your parents were uh, absent or overly passive or uh, any of these other things where you did not have. So a parenting is a uh, is a promise to give a child. It's a privilege to to give a child the right cocktail of uh, four things, love, structure, roots, and wings. And when a child doesn't get that right cocktail of love, structure, roots, and wings, and especially even beginning at the very beginning, Eric Erickson's theory of first, the first task of ch in child development is trust, distrust. And so um, my counselor, uh, so I never heard the words, I never heard the words, I love you. Uh, I I'm proud of you. Uh, I believe you. I have no recollection of ever being hugged as a child. Now, I'm not so naive, Jamie, to think that those things never happen. But isn't it quite significant that even if they did, I still have no recollection of them to this day? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so my counselor, because of those things, said that uh, I think you have been uh, abused and that you have experienced abandonment 
and even gross abandonment. Well, I just about came up out of my chair and strangled her at that point because I, I, I wanted to quickly defend my parents' honor. And, um, and I, and the one thing I did not want to do is write a book that would throw my parents under the bus. And I have not I've written a book that's very compassionate towards my parents. When my dad was two years of age, the youngest of four children, his father abandoned him. So my dad never felt the scratch of a father's whiskers. Never heard a daddy reading him a bedtime story. Never tossed a ball in the background in the backyard. Never had his hair tussled or wrestled on the living room floor. Never heard a truck door at the end of the at the end of a workday, signaling that his father was about to re-enter the family orbit. And so he was basically left to to guess at how to be a, a father to me, uh, my three younger brothers and me, and then uh, how to be a a, a a husband to my mom. And he did a great job with my mom. They had a beautiful, beautiful 56 year marriage. Uh, but I quit high school in the middle of my senior year. Uh, you can uh, imagine that there would be a story, a backstory to that. My next brother, he followed in my footsteps. He eventually died of a heroin overdose. And my two youngest brothers have had uh, way more and their fair share of problems. And my my dad just never saw it coming. Uh, mm -hmm. So if he was here, he would say, well, you know, I take responsibility for what happened to my family. And you, you have to love that. But you just can't give what you don't have. Uh, and so um, I was so harsh towards them, Jamie. Uh, in my 20s, I was, I was so angry uh, at, at them. And it actually all ch changed. It all started to change with a prayer. Uh, I was thinking about you have this prayer ministry, and I was thinking about how all this uh, started to turn around at the age of 25. Would you like to hear about that? Yes, <laughs> actually, I would. Yeah, because that was one of my other questions, you know, is what what role does prayer play in this whole process of of processing these emotions? So, yeah, how tell us about that. I will just for fun, be, because I knew uh, I was coming out with you. I did a search of the book and it has 66 matches for prayer with an asterisk at the end of it. So prayer, prayer, prayerfully uh, is mentioned 66 times in, in my book. <laughs> so prayer is a big part of this book. Yeah. Uh, yeah so uh, my my journey to healing started uh, with a prayer, but it wasn't my prayer. It was my dad's prayer. Wow. It was it was Thanksgiving. I was 25 years of age. Uh, my youngest brother had finally safely returned from war. And it was the first time our family had been together in uh, more than two years. So we sat down at the Thanksgiving dinner. And our family uh, grew up saying, a rote prayer uh, as rapidly as possible. <laughs> God is good, God is great, and we thank you for this food, amen. <laughs> that was it. On this particular Thanksgiving, Jamie, my dad said, uh, I'll, I'll pray today. And he started out and he said, Lord, mom and I would just like to say thank you and that, that's as far as he got. He started blubbering. He just started blubbering. And he excused himself and he went into the bedroom and I followed him in there and I said, Dad, Dad, what's wrong? What's wrong? And he said, well, I'm sorry. He said, it's just that your mother and I, we really never thought that we'd ever see our four boys ever uh, together again. Mm -hmm. And something in my heart softened that day. And... uh just the 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 idea of, hey, my, uh, you know, it's not just about me. You know, my parents have their own challenges, and uh, and uh, so I, I I forgave my parents I, unilaterally, wow. which is, by the way, I think what Jesus calls us to do. I didn't know it at the time. I just made a decision. I didn't need to have them do anything. That I didn't need to have them change anything. Uh, they were not toxic people. They're, my parents are very nice people, uh, very, very good people. So, uh, you know, if, they, if they'd been toxic, that would have been a different way that I would have had to take, right? But they weren't at all that way. And so I just unilaterally forgave them that day. And 
And that put in motion a process that unfortunately took until 53 years of age. So from 25 to 53, that's like 18 years. And, and I'm just, I promise you, it doesn't have to take that long. Uh, and if somebody would have shared with me what I want to share with men uh, in this book, then you can compress that uh, way, way down. Uh, every every man's going to have his own experience, his own process. But the steps are the same. So what it doesn't make a difference how you got into whatever current situation you're in. The only way out is uh, the biblical process of uh, of healing that God pres prescribed. It's been in use, guys, for thousands and gals too, for thousands of years. And psychologists and counselors, you know, continue to to uh, massage it and so forth. But uh, in, in one sense, there really is nothing new under the sun either. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. Well, in this book, you you do kind of give practical some practical tools that men can use to recognize and to begin to process trauma so could you just share a couple of those practical tools obviously you can't go into all of them and everyone yeah. you know is different but do you have a couple that are just kind of like very basic first step here you go this is this is a tool for your tool belt yeah so i think they're basically you know three or four different kinds of exercises so at the end of each chapter, I have this uh, discussion questions. Now I'm all about practical. I'm all about news you can use. I uh, I have a, 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 a I have a PhD in leadership. Right, leadership is all about what we call glittering generalities. <laughs> it's 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 useless information uh, the way it's structured. Uh, so I have a, an allergic reaction to glittering generalities, and so at the End of each chapter are questions to, to really help a man uh, think for himself, reflection and discussion questions. I also really encourage guys to get together and do the uh, do go through the book with a with a, with a group of other guys or even couples. If it, it uh, we'll see how that works out on couples. Um, and then for all these different characteristics, uh, there's a reflection exercise at the end of each one, and we're. Uh, ask the man just to think about, and I'll let me just, I'll just open up. I'll just find one and and see if we can't. So, um, one of the characteristics is you have dramatic mood swings and don't know why. And uh, <laughs> oh gosh, that hurts to say that. <laughs> um, so uh, after a page and a half of helping the man self-assess himself and think about that. Um, I just, I just, I'm picking up a paragraph in here. Um, you're mercurial. You lack self-control over your emotions. You can swing from anger to sadness to fear to good thoughts and then back again to bad thoughts all in a matter of minutes and you don't know why. And I have a page and a half of that. And then at the end is a reflection exercise. And it says, uh, do you have big mood swings that are difficult to explain? Question mark. And then there's a continuum. And I'm, I'm asking the guys to just circle. They can do it mentally or they can do it with uh, a pencil or pen, or they can even use a, you know, a marker. Uh, and the continuum is never. I never have big mood swings that are difficult to explain. Rarely, sometimes, usually, or always. And so there's a process for guys to you know, just understand, you know, understand I'm, I, the first part one of the book is to help men unravel what happened to them, to, to really help them understand uh, uh, their, their childhood wounds. Because if you're trying to solve the wrong problems, you can only succeed by accident. You have to understand the problem. Now, I'm a solutions guy, not a problems guy, but you have to understand what the problem is. Uh, otherwise, it's hopeless. And so that's part one of the book. And that's the exercise, those kinds of exercise in part one. In part two, it's uh, going through a healing process. And then part three is uh, breaking the cycle. And so I have different exercises in each of those that are more relevant to healing and breaking the cycle. So do you find that it gets worse before it gets better as men are processing through this or in your own personal experience? Or do you immediately start to feel kind of a lightning as you go through this process? Well, every man's going to be different, right? Because every man's 
uh, woundedness, if you will, is, is going to be different. Some, some men are just more self-aware. Mm -hmm. Some men are, uh, you know, one, one Terrence real, he, he wrote a book, he's a Harvard, uh, professor. He wrote a book, uh, the last thing we want to talk about, is that the name of it? I, I don't want to talk about it. That's the name of his book. And he said that, uh, he said, most men are so emotionally impaired that not only are they not able to express their emotions, they don't even know they have them. So you have that problem. And uh, that's a hyperbole when he says most men, uh, I couldn't, nobody's done any research on a, on an exact percentage for that particular thought. Uh, but he, you know, he's a clinician, so he has some experience to say that, expertise to say that. So um, I just think the 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 emotional ro roller coaster that guys uh, go through will um, become more transparent to them by reading the book. And self awareness is good. Uh, there will be a point uh, at which you uh, will go through a grieving process. That's part of the healing process. So after I finished defending my parents and and finally faced the truth and got out of denial, then uh, I was sad. Uh, I was sad for what could have been, should have been, what I'd missed. Just was so unfair what happened to my brothers and me and my mom and dad. It's so unfair what happened to them as well. And so that had to be grieved. And so uh, my counselor had a, had good advice. She said, I want you to have a good cry. She said, I, do, I, I, I don't want you, but I don't want you to try to manufacture that. Just process what happened to you. And uh, and then when it comes that that moment of grief, grief, uh, let it let it let it happen. And uh, so I did. I, I did it. And it did happen. And I was able to uh, say a prayer one day uh, as I left her office. I was able to say a prayer uh, that really set uh, set in in course the set in motion the final step of my healing. My healing actually began at 25, and then other things happened at 35 and 47 that are monumental events. But that 53 year old experience with the uh, with the counselor, my mom dying, that was the final the final piece of the puzzle for me. Do you feel like this process is possible without God, or do you think it's enhanced by a faith in God and partnering with God in this, or what are your thoughts? Well, can you ever have complete wholeness without God? Uh, probably not. Um, I do think that the, the um, so... Uh, secularists are are using biblical principles. The the, the ones that are doing it, uh, doing counseling effectively, they're using biblical principles. So, um, I think you can get to uh, a certain point, a certain level of healing. Uh, in fact, I say somewhere in the book, I said these principles work without respect to your beliefs about God. So, I do think if someone will go through uh, the the process, but here's the thing. I also believe that it would be very hard to go through the, the, this process and not come out the other end with a strong faith. Hmm. And I'm going to show the men how to do that if they want to. They don't have to do that, but I'm going to show men how they can do that, how they can come out of this book with uh, a strong faith in uh, Jesus, how they can become a Jesus follower. In fact, my vision is to help as many men as possible uh, heal their childhood wounds, break the cycle, and in the process become devoted or more devoted followers of Jesus. That's that's my that's my mission and vision. I love that. Yep. Well, coming at this from the perspective of a woman, um, and as many of our listeners are women, most are. Um, what advice do you have for us as women? about how we can pray for or support the men in our lives who might have unresolved trauma or who are in the process of processing it and who are in the process of processing. Um, and, and along those lines, what not to do? What should we do? What can we do? And what should we absolutely not do? <laughs> because I know you have some of those too. Yeah. 
Well, the, the, the number one thing, I'll give you some don'ts and some do's, but mm -hmm. the number one don't do is don't, don't give this, this book at your husband. <laughs> Feel free to give it to him uh, or recommend it, but don't give it at him uh, mm -hmm. because uh, that'll just, you know, you know what, we don't need to talk, talk about that anymore. I know. Uh, in terms of uh, what another thing uh, not to do is, uh, so uh, I have one family member who, uh, a younger brother who's a hermit and uh, is, uh, let's just say, resistant to spiritual things. And I've been praying for him for, for several decades. Mm -hmm. Uh, but decades ago, decades ago, uh, the Lord led me to stop talking to him about Jesus. He knows where I stand and uh, not to talk to him about Jesus. I have another, I have a young man that I've been praying for. Well, I, as I said, I have 78 young men and women that I pray for, but I, some of them I have contact with. And so um, one one person I'm thinking of in particular uh, I have not spoken to about, I've not tried to push them towards spiritual things or given them any unsolicited. I have two rules for advice. Number one, it can be taken as a general rule that when someone didn't ask for your advice, neither do they want it. And then number two, there's no greater loss than the right advice given at the wrong moment. And so I just, uh, I, God led me to to, to back off this, this, uh, this man and so we still have a relationship, but I have not, and he, he'll say sometimes, you know, like, well, how was your Bible study this week? Because I teach a weekly Bible study. He said, well, how was your Bible study week? And I'll say, well, it was, it was great. And, uh, but I, I don't, I don't try to fix him. I don't try to push him. I don't try to trick him. Uh, I do have a friend last week, uh, who was telling me who has another, one of my, one of my prodigals, the father of one of my prodigals, who's, a, who's really a, uh, he's in a very bad, bad place. And, uh, but the father cannot resist giving unsolicited spiritual advice. And it just, he can't help himself. And it just keeps driving a deeper, deeper wedge into it. So with your husbands, mm -hmm. um, can I say this on air? Shut say up. It. Yes, you can say that. <laughs> Some of okay. us need to hear it. I know okay, I need I mean, to hear it sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so uh, that's the kick of the pants, you know. Yeah. Just sometimes you just need to okay, put a cork in it. And uh, and uh, here's the thing: First Peter two nineteen is uh, two nineteen to twenty one. One of my big life texts, verse nineteen of chapter two, uh, says, "For it is commendable." When you bear up under the pain of unjust suffering because you're conscious of God. Mm -hmm. Wow. So there's another do for you. I think uh, it's, I'm not saying it's easy, but I have a, 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 a another rule. I have all these governing principles I'm, that I have for myself, but uh, four rules, I, DSAR, I, I will not defend myself. I I'm not going to try to set the record straight. I'm not going to adjudicate the past and I'm not going to retaliate mm -hmm. uh, for unjust suffering. And 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 what it says, it's, it's commendable when you bear up under the pain of unjust suffering. Yeah, yeah, unjust suffering. That's all about pain. It's nothing but pain. But uh, as soon as you re try to retaliate or defend yourself or set the record straight or adjudicate the past, just, you know, everything breaks loose. You know, it's just, it's just, a, it's mayhem. And so uh, I, I'm not saying that's easy, but if you are a mature believer yourself uh, and you can do that, then this is the, this is the right way to go. Um, prayer is probably the, the, the number one thing that a wife can do for her husband. Uh, that's how my wife, uh, that's how I was converted to Christianity. Uh, my wife, uh, uh, began to pray for me. Uh, she would ask me these religious qu sounding questions and I was not giving the right answers. And uh, so, but within two weeks of our wedding, uh, it was pretty clear that I had a misunderstanding about what it meant to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was getting more and more frustrated because money was my God. Success will make me happy and 
money will solve my problems. That was my first worldview. And uh, I was getting so frustrated. And women, if you're listening, you know, because you may do this yourself, but it's just the temptation is to take your frustrations out on the people that are closest to you. And definitely not on the people you work with. I never lost my temper one time at work. Why? Isn't it well, funny how that yeah. works. <laughs> well, I mean, the loss, the potential loss of reputation, even employment itself. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's so great that you you bottle it up and bring it home. Mm -hmm. And then some little stupid thing, some little petty thing sets you off and uh, you have this way, this disproportionate response. You're just way out of proportion to whatever uh, sets you off. And so, uh, yeah, it's just uh, so I was doing that to my wife. And one one day I was ranting and raving and uh, just I just thought if I could just get the frustration, this uh, angst that I was feeling eating away at the lining of my gut, if I could just get it out, expiate it, you know, it, put it into words that somehow I would get some peace, I would get some relief. And so I was saying things to her that a man should uh, never say and she was uh, sitting there uh, taking it, but uh, she had these uh, big tears rolling down her face, which, uh, to be honest, was that not that unusual at that point in our marriage. And after what seemed like, uh, well, she, uh, she, I, I, when I looked at her, I couldn't look away. Uh, she, I was just sort of transfixed. And after what seemed like a, a brief eternity, she said, uh, she asked me this question. She said, Pat, is there anything about me that you like? And I felt like I'd been hazard. And uh, that was uh, that was really the turning point, which led to me becoming a Christian. But she didn't um, she didn't rant. She didn't defend herself. She didn't try to adjudicate. She didn't try to set the record straight. She didn't retaliate that. Uh, she just began to pray. And uh, it, uh, it was her prayers I don't know how it works. All I know is that the Spirit of God heard her prayers and the Spirit of God uh, came over me and I felt conviction for uh, sin and, a, and, and an ache and a longing to, uh, to fill up the hole in my soul that had been left by my childhood wounds. And Jesus uh, came into my life and has been he radically transformed me uh, right away. But it's kind of like cutting a piece of string in half as well. You know, you cut a piece of string in half. So you get rid of half of it, but the half is still there. And then you just keep cutting it in half and it keeps getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And never in this world do we uh, ever get rid of uh, our sinful natures completely, nor should we expect that kind of a utopia. That's a, that's a recipe for heartache. But without some guidance, men, if you're listening, women, if you're listening, whether you're thinking about this for yourself or your husband, um, think of it this way. Yeah, you, this might, this might uh, open up a couple of wounds, but can you think of what your life will be like five years from now, 10 years from now, if you keep doing the same things you're doing now, if you don't make some effort now to make a change. So I would just like to encourage you in the strongest way. And if your husband doesn't want to read the book, I encourage you to read the book. You know, when I got this podcast lined up, I never, never, it actually had never occurred to me that this should probably be thought of as a woman's book as well as a man's book. Uh, because so many women, just the idea of understanding their husbands and then not to mention the side benefit uh, of being able to maybe process some things of your own as well. Um, but I'm a men's author, so maybe I shouldn't go down that road. <laughs> well, we can do that. We can do that on the side. Even though you're you're going to call it a men's book, we can definitely okay. glean a lot from it. So, well, and I will also just throw it out there, women. Uh, Patrick has also written a book called What Husbands Wish Their Wives Knew About Men. That's next on my list to read. <laughs> yeah. I'd like I to know. I hope you enjoy that. Well, Patrick, we are out of time, but this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. And um, where can our listeners connect with you online and on social media and find your 20, how many books? 
uh, 23 books. So 23 books, including this one. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the easiest place to go is patrickmorley.com, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm Patrick Morley, patrickmorley.com. <laughs> and, uh, but then I'm on all the socials, my, uh, you know, at Patrick Morley. I, I, when, when anything came, came out, when they first started Facebook or Instagram, wh whatever it was, I grabbed my own name right away. And uh, if, uh, for those of you who use Linktree, you can go there and uh, it's got links to all the different socials as well as the website. All right. Well, that's fantastic. Well, how yeah. can we pray for you today, Patrick? I'm going to close this out in prayer. Well, thank you for that. Um, so, I have a, a lot of things that I would like to have prayer for, but uh, I do have a relationship right now that I would love to see healed and there's nothing I can do about it to heal it. And mm -hmm. so if you would pray for that, and I'll leave the, the rest of it unspoken if that's all right. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, once again, thank you so much, Patrick, for joining us. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I'm very excited for our listeners to get a hold of this book. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie. It's been an honor. All right. Let's pray. Hmm. Father, we just thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for just the ability to think about um, how important it is to heal how important it is to recognize signs that healing needs to happen. And um, we just pray, God, in Jesus' name, that everyone listening, um, that, you, that you would speak directly to them to show them um, if there are old wounds that need to be addressed and that need to be healed. Um, thank you for this book. Thank you for Patrick just being transparent in his own struggles, brave enough to share his own journey, which I'm sure was painful to go through the first time and then probably brought up some pain going through it again to share it with the world. And we just thank you um, for his obedience and pray that you would use his words to reach more men than he ever dreamed possible. Lord, we do pray that men's lives would be changed, that women's lives would be changed. We pray for it to get into exactly the right hands, that you would just break down any barriers or red tape that would prevent anyone that needs this book from getting it. We pray that there would be healing as a result of this book, that there would be uh, Christian men and women with relationships with you, that uh, hmm. their relationships would become the next step stronger. Um, and we pray for, for salvations, Father, that, that people who may not even know why they got this book in their hands get a hold of it and they meet you there, God, that they meet Jesus and that they have a saving, um, a, a saving faith in Jesus through reading this book and that they are brought from death to life. Um, God, we just pray that it would go out and just multiply in, in the glory that it brings to you and just in the work that it does in the lives of the people who get a hold of it. We lift Patrick up to you and just thank you so much for his ministry. Um, we didn't even get to talk about some of his other ministry um, things that he's doing, but we just pray God that you would set that apart, that you would protect his ministry and his writing, that, um, that you would continue to give him wisdom and vision for next steps, that he would continue to have creativity and um, energy to put toward ministering to men um, and just growing your kingdom and bringing you glory through those things. And um, we do pray, Father, that you would be at work. And more than that, we know you're already at work in this relationship that Patrick desires to be um, restored and uh, that you would be healing it behind the scenes, that whatever it is that um, whatever barriers are standing between him and this person would be broken down. Um, Lord, that this person would um, have clear vision, Father, that there would be no lies, that you would just destroy any lies that, um, that may remain, um, that you would protect this person from the influences of the enemy or spiritual attack, um, and that at the same time you would just help Patrick as he waits 
in this kind of holding pattern um, to feel peace and completeness for his part in, in the restoration of this relationship. God, give him peace. And we just thank you so much for being our father, for being absolutely perfect in your ways and absolutely um, loving in the way that you interact with us and being so willing to reach down and, and care for every detail of our lives and be involved in them. God, thank you. And we just welcome that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen. Amen. Wow. Thank you so much.